Uh, there is a sermon outline, your order of services. Uh, let me actually invite you to actually take that out. That will be helpful uh, to follow, follow along as we look at this portion of the Bible. Uh, let me actually pray for us. Gracious God, we do thank you that you speak and that you reveal yourself in and through your word. We do want to ask as we open up the Bible uh, this Christmas Eve that you might be so gracious as to speak not just to our minds but to our hearts as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Every year in the uh, lead up to Christmas, uh, one of the things that you'll notice is you'll see lots and lots of people preparing. Uh, the Christmas tree will come out. Uh, some of you uh, probably brought up the Christmas tree in the last few weeks. Uh, lights will start to adorn the houses in your suburbs and your streets. Uh, we, we notice that this year, it always happens. LED reindeers appear in people's lawns. Uh, the local Woolworths will start to have a sign reminding us that the Christmas season is upon us. Ham and turkey will start to take center stage when you go to Coles and Woolies. Um, and every physical and online store screams Christmas is here. Don't miss the Christmas special. Uh, I drove past, uh, coming back from a wedding last night, and, you know, uh, I think many of you were at the wedding last night, and if you drove down Pitt Street, I don't know whether you saw the Prada store, the Prada store in the city last night, the display with giant Christmas baubles, and in the center of those baubles were Prada handbags. Or the Lositani store, joy-filled celebrations, moments with those we love, generosity and gifts from the heart. Make Lositani special this Christmas for your loved ones. Or Vic's Meat, right? Those of you who love barbecue, you can order from Vic's Meat. Not anymore right now. Explore our exclusive Vic Christmas collection. Get your Christmas pre-orders in. Even Amazon has got in on this. There's a Christmas shopping guide <clears throat> on its landing page. They all announce Christmas is here. Prepare. Well, it's too late to prepare today, but, <clears throat> you know, in the last few weeks. You know, it's like that popular Christmas song that you've heard that you'll probably hear again at some point this Christmas. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. Why? Because you know the line, who's coming to town? Santa's coming to town. Now, I have to say to you that life is actually a series of preparations out there. Uh, we're constantly preparing for the next thing in our lives. Maybe you're getting married, you're preparing for your wedding. Uh, maybe you're expecting a baby, right, Jen? So you're preparing for your baby. Uh, maybe you're preparing for a new job next year. Or maybe your children, they, you know, maybe your child's going to, to school next year. You, you're preparing them to tie their shoelaces. You're telling them how they should make friends and how to actually make friends. Uh, and so life is a series of constant preparations. Uh, you're a doctor, you do the internship <clears throat> before you start medical work. Uh, in fact, some of you I know today are busy preparing for Christmas Eve dinner. You're doing that very, very last minute, you know, minute shopping this, this afternoon. You're probably doing some cooking this afternoon. Uh, or maybe even last minute gift shopping this afternoon. And so life is just this constant series of preparation. You move from one thing to another. Uh, just speaking to Matt, right, the year is gone. It's just a blur, right? It, was, it felt like it was only last Christmas we were here. We're always preparing for the next thing. Now, why do we always prepare for the next thing? Well, we're always preparing for the next thing because you and I know that success, winning, we all love winning, things going well in our lives depends on how prepared we are. That's why we prepare. Success depends on how prepared you are. It, it's, it, it's, it's true of every sphere of life. Now, Christmas is no different because a truly successful Christmas in God's economy depends on how prepared you are. Even as you busy yourself with the meals that you'll celebrate or the gifts you're going to buy, a truly successful Christmas in God's economy depends on how prepared you are. And this passage speaks of preparing for the birth of Jesus. Well, more so, not just the birth of Jesus, but the coming of Jesus. Uh, because the birth of Jesus is followed by a call to prepare to receive Him. And so in your outlines, you notice that here's the first point. Christmas preparations according to Matthew's Gospel Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus was shaped by a call to repent. And so if you have your Bibles, look at verse 1 and 2. It's actually, you don't even have to look at your Bibles. I printed the, uh, the passages in your outline. Right after the account of the birth of Jesus, <clears throat> there's a shift in gears. Jesus is born Matthew chapter 2. We're told of his birth. Then there's a shift in the scenes in our Bible reading, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. We're introduced to John. John comes preaching publicly. He's making an announcement. And at the very center of his message is a call, verse 2. You can see there, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
heaven has come down. Uh, heaven and earth aren't just meeting, they are colliding. Uh, so the theme for this Christmas was actually, if you, if you saw the slide going up, it's heaven meets earth. And that's a very nice way of saying, you know, heaven comes down. But, you know, the, the, the fly would have looked very different had we, had we said heaven and earth, you know, are colliding. You know, because it's got a, too, too aggressive, right? So you want something more, you know, warm at Christmas. Heaven meets earth. No, heaven and earth are colliding. They're clashing, right? Which means that the image in the background would have looked very different. And, and so John actually says, repent. Now, why repent? Because someone is coming. Someone's about to make an appearance, and he's going to invade your world. Uh, you know, it's like you go to the opera, or you go to the theater, and before it starts, what do they normally see, uh, say? Uh, you hear, you, you hear, uh, you know, you hear a voice. You don't see a face, but you hear a voice to tell you to prepare. Put aside your phones. Take your seats. Get ready. Now, look at verse 3, because John is the voice. A voice in the wilderness calling us to prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for Him. Now, you take verse 2 and verse 3 together, and here's what's happening. A kingdom is coming. An invasion is taking place. And the kingdom of that kingdom is about to make His appearance. Now, who is the king? Okay? Now, the boys and girls who are here, they, they know who we celebrate at Christmas. The king is Jesus. He's the backdrop to the call to prepare. Now, that's the reason why Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, just before the birth of Jesus, you've got Jesus' Ancestry.com, right? No one ever reads Matthew 1 because it's just all these lists of names, but it is Ancestry.com. And, and the reason why Ancestry.com is so important is because pe people sometimes want to find out where they're from. Well, this Ancestry.com actually tells us who he is. And so Matthew chapter 1, verse 17, we read 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile, 14 from the exile to the Christ, the Messiah. The word is Christ. And so we're actually being told that the birth of Jesus, the one who comes to invade the earth, is a king. It announces the birth of a king. And then right after that, we have an account of what happens at his birth, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and wise men or magi from the east come to Jerusalem. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. They come to worship him because they recognize the birth of a king. And in Matthew chapter 2 verse 6 speaks of he comes as a ruler, a king, who will shepherd his people Israel. And so Christmas actually announces the birth of a king, the coming of a king and his kingdom the arrival of the invasion of the kingdom of heaven, as it were. And so the, the way to prepare is to repent. Uh, that is the most important preparation one needs to make at Christmas. Not gifts for your loved ones, not getting the decorations and lights up, not even the turkey or ham. The way to prepare is to receive the king. And you do that by what the Bible calls repentance. Uh, and repentance is nothing more than a change of mind, a change of mindset, a change of posture, uh, making a U-turn in life. Previously, you were moving in one direction. Now you're moving in the other direction in life uh, because something cataclysmic has taken place. Something significant has taken place. Something life-changing has actually happened. And here is the rule of heaven. Now, when people hear the word repentance, they often think it's a negative thing, but if you pause with me and take a step back, it's not always a negative thing, is it? Because the coming of the king of the kingdom of heaven is actually good news. Um, and so, the story of the Bible, or the climax of the story of the Bible, is always the story of what God is doing to repair, reverse, and restore the brokenness in our lives and the brokenness in our world. And so, you know, if you're not familiar with the story of the Bible, if you ever want to explain the story of the Bible to your friends or family or even uh, the, your children, those of you who are parents, and, you know, they say, what's the Bible about, mom and dad? Well, the Bible is the story of what God is doing to repair, reverse, and restore all the messy stuff, the broken stuff in your life and my life and the world. That's, the, that's what the Bible is about. And it climaxes in Jesus, the one who comes to actually do that.
to repair, reverse, and restore brokenness in your life and my life. And so it's good news. And that's why uh, the coming of Jesus, when you read the story of Jesus, uh, the story of Jesus or the life account of Jesus is marked by his power and healing and control over the chaos of people's lives, the chaos of nature, the broken creation. Um, He heals the sick. He gives sight to the blind. He stills the storm. He commands the demons. He raises the dead. Why? Because heaven has invaded the earth. And in the life of Jesus, you are seeing him repair, reverse, and restore broken lives and the broken world. And so it's good news, and that compels us to repent, right? Uh, It's meant to lead to a change in my mind, uh, a posture in my life. Uh, It it means my life, it's it's a turning around in life from living under the kingdom of self to now living under the kingdom of the king who's come. Uh, It's a turning from living under the rule of self to living under the rule of Jesus. And so we're called to prepare for the coming of the king by repenting because he's more than just the baby Jesus. You know, if, if you ask people across the Western world right now, what's the dominant image of Jesus at Christmas? It, it was there actually in the uh, Myers display when I drove past Pitt Street last night. It's the baby Jesus. That's the dominant picture of Jesus at Christmas. Baby Jesus peacefully asleep in the manger watched by shepherds. Okay? I don't know whether we're singing this today. I think we are. But what child is this? You know, the, the carol we sing? Yeah. We're going to sing it, right, uh, after. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Oh, the perfect baby Jesus never cries, never vomits, right? Whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping. But then you've got the chorus, which we'll sing today. And the chorus is, this, this is Christ the King. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. And then the chorus goes, haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord. Uh, It's all English for, be quick, hurry. To bring him praise, for this is Christ, the King. That's what the carol's doing, you know. It's it's balancing the baby Jesus with his kingship, okay. Why repent? Because the baby Jesus at Christmas comes as king. The king of heaven and invasion has begun. Now, in Luke's gospel, which is another account of the life of Jesus, uh, there's a scene in chapter 14, verse 28 to 33. You don't have to look at it, uh, but in that scene... Uh, When Jesus calls people to follow him because he comes as king, uh, what he does is he tells them to count the costs and do the sums, right? Uh, To think very carefully about what they're up against. And he says uh, in in, in Luke chapter 14, he says, um, imagine that a king is going to go to war against another king. And he says, if you're going to go to war against another king, won't you first sit down, work out whether you can with your 10,000 rise against the coming king with 20,000. Now, the logic there is if you're smart and you're wise, what you'll do is you'll send a delegation. And you send a delegation to make peace with the coming king. And Jesus in Luke chapter 14 says, you are the king with 10,000, and I'm the king with 20,000. Okay? He's coming. And so he's effectively saying, you can actually live by the kingdom of your own rule and self, you can reject him. You can even ignore him, which is what most people do. But before you do that, he says, it's worth taking a step back to count the costs. Because if you do the maths, who's going to win? Well, it's not you. Now, a lot of people will do the maths, and they will still choose to ignore or reject the king. This certainly happens over the Christmas season much more, apparently. And a lot of people think, they'll be fine. A few years ago, uh, I've told this story before, one of our pastors at Grace Point, he shared with me uh, from one of our congregations, you know, with great sadness, young man who came to our church for a period of time, (coughs) wanted to find out more about Jesus. Uh, He read the Bible with him for three months. This is one of our pastors. And at the end of the three months, this young man wrote an email uh, saying, and I'll read it to you, I've decided to stop coming 
please don't call me anymore. I understand that becoming a Christian means that I have to live under the rule of Jesus. I have to hand my life over to Jesus. I don't want to do that. I've got other things I'd rather live for. See that? That's a pretty common occurrence. And, you know, I'm glad he was honest enough rather than actually fluff around. But that's effectively saying, I get it. I understand who Jesus is. He comes as king. He demands my life because the invasion of heaven has begun. But I'd rather live by the kingship of my own rule in life. And so some people will do that. Now, it's so important that you and I understand this, right? Because don't for a moment assume that the baby Jesus, meek and mal, simply goes, hey, it's okay. I'm sorry for pushing you. Sorry for making demands. He doesn't just do that, does he? Because you notice that the king who comes is also a king who comes to fix things, to repair, reverse, and restore brokenness in our lives. He also comes as a king to save. So he doesn't just make demands. He comes as a king to save. Uh, And so we we know that from the opening account in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, we read, (coughs) She'll give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so Christmas is also the celebration, not just the coming of a king, but the coming of a rescuer who comes to save, which means that some people embrace his rule, they'll, they'll surrender and receive his offer to save. Others will actually reject it. And here it's really, really important, right? The king who comes to save is also the king who comes to judge. Because as people ignore him, you'll notice verse 11 and verse 12. Notice what we read. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I. The one who comes is much more powerful, John says. He will baptize you with the spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And so we know he comes as king and he comes to save, but he also comes to separate. He comes to divide. And so the good news of Christmas is that God's king has come to save us from our sins, but the bad news of Christmas is that he also comes to separate, to divide, to sort out, because not everyone receives Jesus as king. That's the reality. Not everyone thinks they need rescue, Not everyone thinks they need him as king and savior. And so Christmas is good news, but it's also bad news, isn't it? It's not just a celebration of peace, but for many in our city, and for some of us, it's a declaration of war. We often forget that. That's why John says, prepare for Jesus at Christmas by repenting. Because, and it's good news because it's the start of what God is doing to repair and reverse and restore the brokenness in our lives and our world. Now, come down to verse 6. is there in your outline as well because you have a physical picture of what that looks like, what repentance actually looks like, okay? You notice a repentance, it's there, confessing their sins that were baptized by him in the Jordan River. That's a visible expression of repentance, A picture of people who are preparing themselves for the coming of the king, the rule of heaven. Notice they come confessing their sins. They openly admit they've lived their lives for the kingdom of self. They've ignored God. They come admitting their guilt and failure in life. They know they need forgiveness. I haven't lived your way, God. I've ignored you in my life. Right? And as they confess their sins, they're baptized. It's a picture of how God's rescue works. Notice all they did was confess their sins, right? That's the admission that there's nothing I can do to save myself. That's what confessing your sins is, right? I can't save myself. I can't can't fix uh, my stuff-ups in life. I can't fix my past. I need you to save me. God, I need you to wash me. I need you to forgive me. And it's good news, right? Because the king has come to save Now, notice that in baptism, you do nothing. Uh, Often we do baptisms here, and and I often remind us that in baptism, you don't baptize yourself. You don't wash yourself. You don't prepare by being good enough, right, to be baptized. You don't try to make up for your life and your, uh, your past failures before you come to be baptized. No, you confess your sin, and you receive what God does. It's a reminder to us that God alone saves. And that's why we sang in the opening carol, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. 
The king has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Let every heart repent. That's what it's saying. Let every heart confess their sin. Let every heart surrender. Let every heart turn and come under the saving rule of the king. That's the most important preparation every heart needs to make at Christmas. Not what gifts you buy. Not what food you eat. Not where to shop on Boxing Day. But whether you are repentant. Now, if you read verse 7, this is what you discover about real repentance. It's very straightforward, right? Because there's a group of people there. They are watching, but they are silent. Okay? They stand as silent observers. Now, they're silent because they don't think they need to repent. They're the religious. So, in Matthew chapter 3, they're the good guys at Christmas. Okay? They're the good guys because surely the call to repent only applies, and we all think like this, if only if you're a really, 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 really bad person. And when I look around the room, we're not really that bad, are we? Notice what happens in verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, and they're standing back, he said to them, you brood of vipers, you snakes, who warn you to flee from the coming wrath? They're the good guys, because the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're the, they're the religious, right? They're the good guys of, at Christmas. They, they've lived a moral life. They keep the Ten Commandments. <coughs> they practice good works. They give to feed the poor. Uh, and so, if there was ever a group that the king would have received, surely it would have been these guys. Law-keeping, moral people, doing good works. But John actually calls this group of people snakes, right? It's not a term of, it's not a compliment. You snakes. Now, Jesus does that too, right? Because in Matthew chapter 12 and chapter 23, Jesus calls these groups, this group of people snakes. Why? Because they look good on the outside, right? So they keep the law, they look like moral people, they do lots of good stuff. But if he says, if you look beneath the surface, you find that something has gone off. There's rot under the surface. Because externally they do everything right, but he says their hearts are hollow, okay? Because when you get to chapter 23 of Matthew's gospel, and we're not looking at that today, you discover they are more concerned with the externals of their life, looking good before people, uh, and they are more concerned with that than God's praise or God's approval. So in other words, they are legalistic, but they don't love people. Um, they do good, but they take pride in their morality. Um, they do good, but they don't really care for justice and mercy. So in other words, they look good on the outside, but they neglect what's in here. And so, it's good for us to remember this, right? Good deeds doesn't make you a good person, right? Good deeds doesn't make you a good person. If in your heart you're evil and self-absorbed, if in your heart you only good, do good so that you, know, you feel good about yourself or so that people praise you, if in here you're a proud and greedy person, it doesn't matter how much good you do, if in here you're malicious and angry, well, it doesn't make you a good person. Well, Jesus says the good guys watching are filled with hypocrisy and wickedness because they look good on the outside, but on the inside, they're not good. And so there's no repentance because they believe that keeping the form of religion was sufficient, good enough for God. Uh, T.S. Eliot in his poem, Hollow Men, he writes, these people are shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. They are hollow. And so, if there was a group of people, people you thought should have been prepared, would have been prepared for Jesus and the kingdom, it would have been these good guys. But they're unprepared because they lack the fruit of repentance. Uh, look at verse 7 and verse 8. He says, Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Show fruit that you are actually, you've actually surrendered to the king. You say you welcome the king. You've trusted the king. Where's the fruit? You say Jesus is rescuer, where's the fruit? You say you've trusted him to save you, where's the fruit? So he says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And the fruit of repentance is always a changed life. That's why repentance, notice you were moving in one direction, now you're moving in another direction. Your mindset was set on this, now your mindset has changed. Uh, later in Matthew chapter 7, which we're not looking at, Jesus says the fruit of repentance is 
the life of obedience, a changed life. Now living under the rule of a different king rather than the rule of your own life, right? The fruit of obedience uh, is a mark of the truly repentant life, surrendering to the rule of the king. I've told this story before, but you know, the Morgan Sea Gypsies are a small tribe of about 180 fishermen uh, who spend much of their time on their boats fishing in the Ottoman Sea. Uh, that's between India to Indonesia and the back of Thailand. And so they live on the beaches of South Thailand. Uh, and then we all know what happened uh, with the tsunami in 2005. Uh, in December 2005, if you remember the hours before the tsunami came onto the shores of that part of Asia, took over 175,000 lives. Now, the Morgan Sea Gypsies, they were living on one of those beaches where the tsunami hit. They, the whole village could have been wiped out, right? Had they not been prepared, had they not listened to the fruit of their elders, had they not borne the fruit of repentance, had they not trusted the counsel and word of their elders. So this is what happens for generations the elders of the tribe had passed down a, a single piece of information to this tribe of Morgan Sea Gypsies. And they were constantly reminded to be watchful and prepared. And so in an interview with the 65-year-old village chief, he said, the elders told us that if the waters recede fast, it will reappear in the same quantity in which it disappeared. You and I know that's exactly what happened. You know what happens to tsunami? The sea drains, right, from the beach. And what happens is when that tsunami came in 2005, the sea drain and those fish, right, for hundreds of meters along the sandy beaches, easy for those who live off the sea to run out and start collecting fish, right? Every basket filled. And you know what? Some people did that on the beaches of Thailand. When they saw the, the sea recede, they saw the fish and they went out to gather fish. Right, those of us who like fishing, imagine that, right? Wow, fish on the beach flopping around, go pick them up. And some people did that. You know, it's not good enough to know what's happening or what you need to do unless you act on it, which is what the Morgan Sea Gypsies did. You know, when the waters receded, they didn't go out into the ocean. They ran for the mountains. They were prepared. They knew what was happening. They acted on it. That's the fruit of listening to the word and the counsel of the elders the fruit of trusting the word of the elders, all 181 of them were saved. You know, repentance is just like that. Not good enough to know what you need to turn from. Not good enough knowing you need to repent. Not good enough to know you need to change your direction in life. Not good, just good enough to know you need saving. But an actual turning to the king. Jesus says, or John actually announces, the colliding of heaven and earth, the king of the kingdom of heaven has come, and he comes not just to save, but to judge. And so he says, be prepared. Repent. And the fruit of repentance is now trusting in the one who comes to rule, to save. Trusting his counsel and coming under his rule in life. And so here's the third thing. Look at verse 9 with me. Preparing for the king must be personal. Right? Preparing for the king of the kingdom of heaven has got to be personal. Notice what John says, verse 9. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. Don't say that Abraham is your father. This is often my experience when I meet people. I get a range of responses, uh, especially when people ask me what I do for work. Sometimes it kills the conversation when they find out I'm a pastor. It's like, oh, don't know what to say now, right? But often when people find out I'm a pastor, they always want to tell me their religious connection. Always happens at weddings, right? They find out you're a pastor. You're sitting on a table with you know, people you don't know. They find out you're a pastor. And then they want to tell you your, their religious connection. And I'm thinking, why? Like, do you want me to bless you? Like, what? So, and so you, people will say things. Oh, you know, I have an uncle that was a pastor. And I'm going, uh, yeah, okay. Or they'll say, my grandma was Anglican. Or I used to go, you know, to Manly Presbyterian Church as a youth. Or, oh, I used to go to Beach Mission as a youth. Oh, I, I have some Christian friends at work. And I'm going, okay, what's that got to do with anything, right? Um, or I used to sing in a choir. That's the one I normally get. I used to sing in a choir. And I'm, okay, yeah, so what? Right, okay. So John would actually say that as well. So what? Does it make you one step closer to God? Does it place you on the inside? 
You know, does it give you some special discount in God's kingdom? Does it prepare you to meet God? John says, God can raise up the children of Abraham from these stones. And so, it's so important for us to understand it. A second-hand faith isn't worth anything. It's not about knowing Abraham, but knowing Abraham's God. It's, it's not about knowing Abraham, but actually knowing the promised son of Abraham, Jesus, God's king. He says, you must be prepared to receive God's king personally. Repentance must be personal. You cannot rely on someone else's repentance. Even if you come from a Christian home, you cannot depend on someone else's fruit. I go to a church where people are committed to living under the rule of Jesus. Well, no. Are you living under the rule of Jesus? You cannot borrow someone else's faith. My, my family has always been a, a Christian family. I should be okay. No. Have you trusted Jesus? You, you cannot depend on someone else's preparation this Christmas. You must personally repent. You must personally turn to Him. And this applies not just to people who don't know Jesus. This applies to those of us who are followers of Jesus as well. And that's why we celebrate Christmas each year, right? Uh, I said to Matt, what's really interesting is what we don't realize as those of you who are Christians, what you don't realize is that the, the calendar, the 12 months of our calendar is built on the Christian story. Because you notice we celebrate Easter, we celebrate Christmas, right? We celebrate the birth of Jesus we celebrate his death and his resurrection, and then the cycle begins again. And if you're a follower of Jesus, it's meant to make you realize that we live in the year of the Lord. The story of redemption is being played out year after year, and we are part of that story. And, and, and the seasons are there to remind us of God's story, what God is doing in the Lord Jesus to repair, reverse, and restore. And you and I are engaged and involved in that story. And at Christmas, we're called to prepare to receive the King. The Lord is come, let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare and make, him, make room for Him. Make peace for Him. Have you done that? What are you preparing for this Christmas Eve? So many of you are going to rush off. I know you've got stuff to prepare for, but what are you preparing for this Christmas Eve? You've got children? I know they're looking forward to Christmas morning. But what are you preparing them for at Christmas? Don't forget to prepare for the one thing that matters most. Prepare for Jesus, the King of the Kingdom of Heaven. And so Christmas is both good news and bad news, isn't it? It's good news and bad news because the King comes to save but also to judge. And so every Christmas, the King looks for repentance and the fruit of repentance, whether we will surrender to His rule whether we will acknowledge our need for Him to save us from our sin constantly. Verse 11 and verse 12, He comes to separate. When heaven meets earth, when heaven invades earth, it also brings with it a separation, a great divorce. Christ, the birth of the King, also brings a great divorce. But it's also good news, isn't it? It's good news for those of us who have trusted the Lord Jesus. It doesn't mean we don't need to repent because in all the Christmas carols we've sung, the call is for us to prepare. Even if you're a follower of Jesus, the call is to start Christmas in a spirit of repentance. The acknowledgement that we're broken people, that we need forgiveness. The acknowledgement that we need to turn from living under the rule of self to living under the rule of Jesus. Christmas is actually good news because it's a fresh start, isn't it? The king has come to save. That's the good news of Christmas, right? The past, my past this last year, my failures this last year can actually be written off. I think that's the best news ever because it means, the coming of Jesus means tomorrow is a new day. And tomorrow is a fresh start. Tomorrow is a new year. Why? Because the King has come. And so in the busyness of the Christmas season, can I encourage you to make preparation for the one thing that matters. Prepare for Jesus, God's King and His kingdom.